Hey, welcome everyone to the Provost Lecture Series. Um, so today we're here to celebrate Professor Takahashi before he leaves OIS for his uh, beautiful retirement back in Kyoto. And uh, so please take a seat if you can move towards uh, the front. And uh, so in addition, so we have several um, um, Speaker phones, so if you have any questions after, uh, after the, the talk, please come forward, okay? And uh, just a, a very brief kind of summary. Since we started the Provost Lecture Series in November 2022, and so we, we have uh, many excellent speakers, and all OIS faculty members, either they have received significant awards or reach um, significant milestones, such as being promoted to uh, associate professor or full professors. And so, so today is the number 11 uh, the lec uh, for the lecture series. And uh, again, I want to thank um, everyone who has been very supportive of this uh, provost lecture series, covering many different divisions from office of the provost, the CPR, and also uh, the core facilities engineering support section, they have been helping us to, to uh, also CPR to design uh, the gifts and also 3D print uh, um, the, uh, the test from, from the frame, special picture frame. So I just want to again thank everybody um, who has been uh, a strong supporters for this lecture series. And uh, so there are also some upcoming lectures um, before the end of the fiscal year. Uh, uh, so in 22 days, Yasha will be giving his Provost Lecture Series, and also Professor Satoshi Mitarai, and also, also Yuko. And uh, so the, the two last uh, uh, lectures are pretty close to each other due to just people's uh, availability and also the chair's availability. And so, so we'll send out reminders uh, to remind everyone. And without further ado, so I would like to ask Professor Kenji Doya uh, to introduce Professor Takahashi and chair the session. Thank you, Amy. Yeah. All right. So it is uh, my great pleasure uh, to uh, uh, take the role of uh, a chair for Tomoyuki's uh, uh, special lecture. Yeah, I was uh, honored and uh, surprised uh, to uh, uh, Tomoyuki uh, uh, nominated me uh, as uh, the, uh, the uh, chair uh, for uh, for his lecture. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah. So uh, probably the uh, one of the reason uh, is that uh, yeah we are we are graduated from the same uh, high school. So in uh, Komaba, yeah. So I didn't know that when I was a, a high school student, uh, but he was uh, a few years, uh, several years uh, senior uh, to, to me. And then uh, actually, so uh, his classmates uh, includes uh, quite uh, important people. For example, uh, Dr. Omi, who t took the role of uh, uh, guiding Japan through the COVID. Uh, and also, uh, yeah, so Mr. Kuroda, who guided the Japan's economy for the last decade, right? Yeah, so, uh, and uh, after uh, a few decades, uh, I started uh, my postdoc in uh, neurobiology. And at that time, uh, the patch clamp uh, was the uh, coolest uh, new technology. And I didn't know that at that time, uh, but uh, this is the kind of method Tomoyuki developed together with uh, Bart Sackman. Yeah, so, uh, and then uh, uh, after joining OIST, we took uh, serotonin as one of the major research target. And then uh, I realized that uh, Tomoki uh, was already doing in a, in a very pioneering work of how the uh, serotonin uh, works, for example, in this case, in the spinal cord. Right. Yeah, so, uh, and then uh, basically wherever, wherever I go, I found uh, Tomoki's previous footsteps. So I'm very much impressed. 
And furthermore, uh, most recently, uh, we are working on like a functional MRI of uh, mice using the, our uh, uh, mouse MRI capacity here. So at that time, the, uh, the difference of the brain response with and without the anesthesia was the, a big issue uh, for us to get the uh, paper accepted. And then I again realized that Tomoki has already been working on this uh, problem. Yeah, so uh, I'm uh, uh, very uh, uh, honored to have uh, uh, this uh, senpai, uh, the senior uh, to, to, from my school, uh, leading uh, us uh, in many different ways. So uh, today um, you will hear a lot about his uh, research uh, uh, career in the last half a uh, decade, uh, half a century. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, so most recently uh, the, uh, I received an email uh, like this. So Tomoki is also uh, like an active uh, person in the Oyster tennis team. And then we have a, I get this kind of mail. And when I go to a, a tennis court, I always find uh, Tomoki always, already playing. <laughs> yeah. So uh, and then uh, without uh, spending uh, any more time, I would like to ask uh, Tomoki to present his lecture. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kenji and Ami, for a nice, nice and uh, <laughs> introduction. And uh, so I didn't know that I, I left my footstep. <laughs> and uh, but I know that he he's coming from the same high school. Yeah, <laughs> and it's very nice to know. Anyway, <clears throat> so today um, I'm going to talk about my past work. <clears throat> And in the, uh, early, in the initial part, I'd like to play back very quickly <laughs> the work before I come to it. And uh, thereafter, I'd like to go into the, a little bit more slow uh, playback of the work I did in OIST. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but it is, I found it very difficult to squeeze uh, 50 years into a 40, 40 minutes, <laughs> to be honest. And so, uh, so let's start. So when I was a student in a medical school, um, I was interested in uh, I was interested in the brain, how brain works, like other students, and uh, I was particularly uh, oriented to do a basic uh, brain science, and decided to do that, and in, eventually wants to contribute to the, to the therapy of the neuronal brain uh, diseases, if possible. <laughs> that was my dream. <laughs> so I uh, knocked the door of the pharmacological laboratory, which is headed by Masanori Otsuka, who has discovered GABA as an inhibitory neurotransmitter in Harvard University in the Kufra's laboratory. And now he's a professor there. So I uh, asked him, <coughs> and he proposed me a, a very interesting project, interesting but very challenging pro project, which is to discover a primary sensory neurotransmitter. So a uh, sensory neurotransmitter is, was not totally unknown. The motor transmitter was established to be acetylcholine, in 1931 by, uh, 35 by Henry Dale, but uh, no uh, information about sensory transmitter. So, and, uh, uh, so if you know that a little bit of the uh, anatomy in the, uh, in the, in the, um, in the spinal cord, there are two, two um, roots. One is a dorsal root, and the other one is a, a ventral root. And the dorsal root is exclusively sensory uh, fiber. Uh, and the ventral root is a motor fiber, which innovates to the muscle. And so the, the uh, strategy or uh, <coughs> working hypothesis of Masanori was to, uh, it was that if there is a sensory transmitter, it must be in the dorsal roots, but not in the ventral roots. So it's a very strong hypothesis. But, and so we then started to find a 
bioactive substance which is exclusively expressed in dorsal roots. So you went to the slaughterhouse and collected the dorsal roots and ventral roots and uh, made a rough, <coughs> very crude extraction and put it to the gel filtration column. And I, we found that there is, a, there is indeed a, a bioactive peak, which is just on the dorsal roots, but not on the ventral roots, as you see here on the left side. And so, and uh, so this has this peak has a, a peptide properties. Uh, it can be abolished by a chymotrypsin treatment. So we called it dosa root peptide, with a unknown <laughs> origin. But anyway, so it, it has a gut contracting bioactivity. So uh, so it's a far from the sensory transmitter by itself. But it is anyway, it is a dorsal root bioactivity. And so, and then we uh, realized that <coughs> the substance P has a similar bioactivity. Substance P was uh, discovered by von Neurer in 1931. And uh, so this, this was actually the primary sequence was elucidated at that moment. And it was a undeca peptide. And then I, we uh, obtained the synthetic substance P and compared the property with dorsal root peptide in two-dimensional electrophoresis, high-voltage electrophoresis, and found that they are identical. So we identified that dorsal root peptide is a substance P. And so, and then as a next step, I wanted to know uh, the sensory ending in the spinal cord where it goes, and where is it substance P is concentrated. And I did a <coughs> sec, sec, uh, separation of the uh, region in the, dorsal, uh, in the spinal cord, and found it in the dorsal lateral part of the, of the dorsal horn. It was highly concentrated there. But when you uh, did a, uh, so when we transect, uh, when we cut, and uh, those are roots, and if you wait several days, then this uh, high concentration in the dorsal lateral part uh, is disappeared. And also, uh, at the cut end of the dorsal roots, and there is a huge accumulation of this bioactive, substance P bioactivity. So it means that uh, substance P is, is synthesized in the dorsal root ganglia and it is transported to the spinal cord and mainly released as a dorsal lateral part of the, the spinal cord. And so this actually <coughs> is okay for a, a candidate for a transmit, uh, sensory transmitter, but I thought it is more likely to be a pain transmitter rather than a general sensory transmitter. But uh, Masanori has a different opinion. <laughs> and so he wants to, uh, to regard it as a general sensory transmitter. And so the key question is whether it has a, a excitatory uh, response to, uh, in the motor neuron. So I tried uh, to apply it to the motor neuron in, first in vivo <coughs> and failed for one year <laughs> because Pharmacology in in vivo animals is extremely difficult, and uh, there is no clear cut results obtained by that. <coughs> so I changed my <laughs> strategy and into the in, uh, in slice, <coughs> and uh, I, have, I thought I have to see the motor neuron directly to make a proper pharmacology. So to see that, you need a thin slice. So. To, for the light to be transparent. So I uh, made a 130 micrometer thick slice. It's open to one millimeter. And uh, then this is a spinal cord slice. And then I uh, managed to see the motor neuron under the TIC condenser with 40x uh, water immersion objective. And I penetrate the micro, glass microelectrode in the motor neuron, and I recorded the action potential and spontaneous potential. 
And when I applied glutamate bionophoresis to the motorium directly, I have <coughs> got uh, some various responses of, of the glutamate. So it, has, it certainly has a glutamate receptors, but uh, unfortunately, we couldn't produce a substance B response. And then later, it was established that substance B is a pain transmitter, in fact. And it has no effect on the motonium, no direct effect on the motonium. So my failure was not uh, too long. <laughs> And, uh, but uh, <coughs> but at, le at least I had got a preparation here, so which might be extended in the future, I thought. But I quit the uh, project here and then went to the postdoc training <coughs> to the University College London in 1977 in the laboratory of Bernard Katz and Miredi. <coughs> and, uh, so where I, I was trained to uh, monitor the intracellular calcium uh, dynamics, and that was away from my previous uh, uh, experience, but it, as a postdoc, it's a good experience, I thought. So I followed that. <coughs> and, uh, and then we have used uh, uh, acorine, which is a jellyfish uh, luminescence protein, And uh, <coughs> which we are donated from Dr. Shimomura. And then we injected it. I injected it into the skeletal muscle <coughs> of the first twitch and throat twitch muscle. And uh, we f I found that the uh, kinetics <coughs> of the intracellular calcium is very different. In the first twitch muscle, the calcium uh, dynamics is much, much faster. So it is, it corresponds well to the fast contraction and slow contraction. And this is against the dogma that the fast and slow construction is made of the myosin properties difference. So, but it is, <coughs> anyway, it is a results. So, uh, then, anyway, <laughs> so after that, I come back to Kyoto. <coughs> And I, I uh, come back to Japan and I joined in Kyoto in the laboratory of Motoikuno Physiology. And we are uh, in the same campus, the famous molecular biologist Numa was cloning a, a lot of function receptors and he actually uh, cloned acetylcholine receptor and asks us to help him, <coughs> help them with a uh, with uh, uh, measuring the uh, current uh, caused by acetylcholine to be sure it is function that the ground receptors are real, real one, <laughs> functional receptors. So they have um, <coughs> used the cDNA, cRNA into the uh, xenopersocytes, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, subunit. And uh, I have <coughs> made a two volt electrode voltage clamp and applied uh, acetylcholine. And then I had a response, which was reversibly blocked by the CRARE, which is an antagonist of the acetylcholine receptors. And thereafter, um, <coughs> Numa wanted to uh, go into the depths <laughs> of the each individual subunit function. And so, in fact, he has found alpha, beta, gamma, delta subunit, and also epsilon subunit. So, and uh, it was a bit too much for me to uh, work on that. And uh, they have decided to collaborate with Bruce Suckman in Gettingen. So I went to uh, Gettingen. <coughs> and uh, then uh, in the laboratory of the Bruce Suckman, we have uh, used the, uh, the oocyte expressed with alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon first. And then we have seen uh, two different type of channels. One is slow and small conductance, the other one is fast and uh, large conductance. But when we separate, <coughs> separately expressed alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and alpha, be uh, beta, uh, epsilon, delta, they are clearly separated. So it means, <coughs> and, and then when, when we have seen it, we have got an idea. It must be a developmental switch from uh, gamma to epsilon because 
it has been reported <coughs> that the, that the uh, receptor channel is small and slow uh, in the early fetal early stage of the development, and it becomes fast and larger. And it, in fact, it was confirmed in a, in a uh, bovine uh, muscle in the fetal and uh, adult muscle uh, channels uh, coincided with uh, gamma uh, gamma nephrin containing receptors. <coughs> So these are the <coughs> kind of uh, collaboration <laughs> with numerous group, and I have got a, uh, for the first time I have got a collaboration with a molecular biologist, and it was quite educational, and but it was also very very hard <laughs> because of the the way of thinking is very different between molecular biologists and physiologists. So we had a lot of <laughs> collision at <laughs> many times, <laughs> but it was by itself it was quite educational to me. So, uh, and, uh, and during that time, I realized that I'm a physiologist. <laughs> so, so I uh, talked to um, Bruce Sackman and whether he is interested in uh, applying the patch clamp technique. Uh, he devised it to the synthesized preparation, which I developed in 1978. And uh, he, he became extremely <laughs> excited and become uh, very positively agreed with it. And so, so we decided to collaborate together. And in the next two years, I, I come back and forth between getting and, and uh, Kyoto, and uh, uh, we uh, established the method. And, but it was, it took so long time, but uh, at the end, it turned out to be very, very simple. So to do the patch clamp recording from the slice a neuron, you have to remove the, uh, remove the tissue uh, covering the uh, surface of the neuron. And to do that, you have to blow it up. <laughs> and so with post pressure, like a grass cutter does, you see. And so we have applied positive pressure from pipette, big pipette, and then it removed. Now this is a standard method now. And so, <clears throat> And it was established in 1989, and uh, so this method has distributed to, to uh, many, many laboratories in the world because this is the first time that one can record from the real neurons in the slice with patch clamp method. And the advantage of patch clamp is that it is extremely stable so that you can record one hour easily. And also, you can control the intracellular uh, uh, ionic concentration, etc. So it is uh, far better than the microelectro recording I did initially. And uh, hence uh, it becomes uh, universally available. And But uh, then I have to survive. <laughs> so after several years, I was appointed to a chairman in Tokyo University. And I've got, I've started decided to, to start recording from presynaptic tunnel. It's more challenging, not just from the neuron. And so to do that, I invited Ian Forsyth from Western University, and who has been working at this particular synapse, Calyx Herd, that is a, a giant synapse <coughs> in the uh, auditory uh, brainstem. And it's a glutamatergic uh, synapse. And, uh, but by doing the uh, pre- and postsynaptic paired patch clamp recording, we are able to see the response like that, and also we can load anything we like into the presynaptic tunnel. So that, that I think is a quite useful method, and so we decided to concentrate our work to the presynaptic tunnel, because nothing much is known about the presynaptic property, whereas postsynaptic properties are well known. So this is a, a black box and a new field. So we can actually uh, cultivate uh, by using this method. So the, the, uh, among many things, uh, I, I, I most my, one of my, my favorite uh, work is about a uh, uh, challenge to the saturation hypothesis. So it was strongly believed that uh, presynaptic glutamate saturate postsynaptic uh, receptor, glutamate receptor, ample receptor, 
And if it saturates, <coughs> the synaptic efficacy is determined by uh, receptor density or receptor sensitivity. Not from, there is no room for the presynaptic uh, contribution. So, but I wanted to test it directly. And the direct method we can do is to, to load glutamate at high concentration in the presynaptic tunnel. So that if, we, if the receptor is saturated, the high, if you load high concentration glutamate, that is incorporated in the vesicle by a, a vesicle transporter using the ATP. And then, <coughs> then it is <coughs> released, but then it should, if it is saturated, it doesn't work. So there should be no difference in the response sites. But when we loaded uh, the glutamate uh, at high concentration, in fact, a single vesicular response and a multiple response are both enhanced clearly. So it means that this postsynaptic receptor is far from saturation. So this is uh, uh, quite uh, revolutionary at this moment. And uh, at that moment, and in other synapses, uh, there are different strategies uh, with experience made. And now uh, people believe that the receptors are not saturated. So, uh, so this strategy we use in opposite way, and we uh, then uh, we uh, we go ahead. But so that was after I retired <laughs> Tokyo University, and I went to the uh, I moved to the Doshan University in Kyoto, and in 2007, <laughs> and where I worked with Tetsuhori here, and uh, so. Uh, we first wash out the glutamate from the presynaptic site, so then the EPSC site declines to the close to zero, zero. And then uh, we, at the same time, we load a caged glutamate. Caged glutamate is glutamate, but it is inactive because it is, ca it is bound to caged compound. But if you apply a uh, UV light, it is cleaved so that the uh, glutamate is freed and the glutamate concentration quickly goes up. So, so we used it, and then, uh, then the EPSC amplitude uh, goes back to the original size. So from this um, time course of the recovery, we uh, estimate the, the refilling time of glutamate into the vesicle and which turn out to be 14 seconds at room temperature and seven seconds at physiological temperature. And so this is quite slow in a way. Um, and uh, so it means that it's a, a limit, rate limiting step of the vesicle reuse after recycling. So uh, if there is a, a very fast endocytosis, something like a sub-second, millisecond endocytosis, it doesn't mean much to the uh, total physiology because the vesicle is empty, so it doesn't do any physiological contribution. So the vesicle has to wait another tenth of minute, tenth of second before it is fully filled with neurotransmitter. So it has a big uh, physiological impact uh, to measure the uh, time course of the refrain. And uh, another piece of evidence, uh, piece of work is made uh, on the question of the distance between the vesic synaptic vesicle and the calcium channel in the nerve terminal. And uh, so this is um, this was made uh, just by collaboration with uh, Angus Silva in University College London and uh, David de Gorio in Pasteur and uh, uh, Shigemoto, Ryuichi Shigemoto in Aista. And so we worked together. And so Nakamura headed this work. And, uh, <clears throat> and we measured the calcium uh, transient from the terminal, calyx of the terminal in the top, top one, which follows action after action potentials in a confocal spots, in different spots of the terminal. And we loaded EGTA in the present terminal to chelate calcium and to, ha to see how much the EPSC size is attenuated. 
and uh, and we made a simulation out out of these and uh, other uh, results, including the uh, you know freeze fracture uh, identification of the gold stain uh, uh, calcium channel particles by Shigemoto, and we found it, and he found it. It's it clustered in the in the terminal. So it's a uh, calcium uh, channel clusters, uh, and, and calcium channel is cl has a cluster, and so the measurement should be <coughs> from the vesicle to the cluster of the calcium channel. So it's a perimeter of the calcium channel. So this perimeter uh, vesicle distance is uh, is turned out to be a tens of nanometer, which we uh, calculated um, estimated from the simulation. And then it fits very well to the uh, to the reality. And when this distance become longer, the response become uh, smaller and uh, slower, so that the transmission uh, signal transfer becomes smaller. And in fact, it was a case in the very immature uh, synapses. The distance is uh, longer, and then it uh, becomes shorter uh, in uh, during the development. And that's uh, other other synapse like hippocampus. The, this coupling distance is much longer, so that the, so it, the response itself is very slow in hippocampus compared with the delay synapse, uh, the Kellogg's which is extremely fast uh, synapses. So uh, then, uh, so then, <coughs> then I. Uh, at the same time, uh, to the Doshi University, I've got an appointment in OIST. So from now, it is a uh, work in OIST. So out in OIST, um, I have got a, a small laboratory in Uruma City, and uh, with uh, with Yamashita and also Ebuchi, and worked and Watanabe also. And uh, so so Yamashita uh, Takayuki Yamashita. Uh, Introduce the capacitance measurements, uh, which is a capacitance uh, measurements of the presynaptic membrane. And the, the membrane capacitance is proportional to the membrane area, as you know, if you know a bit of physics. And uh, <coughs> this, so that it is to measure the membrane, presynaptic membrane. Yeah? And uh, so, in fact, one femtofarad uh, responds to 12.7 vesicle. Basically, has a 50 nanometer uh, outer diameter, so you can actually calculate that. And uh, uh, so, when when the uh, basically is exocytosis, and they are, they are uh, they release transmitter at the same time. So many many vesicles are used at the same time. So there is a big jump in initially. It's exocytosis followed by a slow recovery. That is because of the endocytosis, which is occurring more randomly. <coughs> and so that using this capacitance measurement, you can actually separate exocytosis and endocytosis. So this is a very useful tool for the dissecting the mechanism of the presynaptic function. So, and they could use this. <coughs> Uh, you must use this and, uh, and uh, uh, reported that endocytosis by itself is calcium dependent, not just exocytosis, but endocytosis is also calcium dependent. And Eguchi found that uh, exocytosis and endocytosis are kind of balancing. So when, the, when there is a massive exocytosis, endocytosis becomes faster and to compensate the loss of Vesicles. And so this compensation is mediated by the very sophisticated cascade, starting from glutamate to NMD receptor, neutral, nutric acid, NO, and uh, PKG, um, G kinase, and uh, uh, low kinase, and PAP2 to, to the endocytos. And uh, so you can say that because if you use a broker, it can be. Uh, Easily averaged. So the you know monitoring the endocytosis slowing by the in the presence of the blockers, which was in many cases loaded 
directly into the uh, nerve terminal, uh, calyx where the plasma will come, and we have proved that. And, uh, <coughs> and Dimit that Dimitrov, um, after he became a full-time prof professor in August 1915, uh, 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 no, 20, <laughs> sorry, 215, uh, Dimitrov has uh, developed a very nice preparation, for culture preparation. He dissected out the presynaptic and postsynaptic region separately and co culture and the form new synapse, which is turned out to be giant. <laughs> and so, this is a, a calyx like uh, terminal in culture. So, if you put it in culture from slice, the advantage is that it is transparent so that you can easily <coughs> make a imaging studies and also you can easily uh, manipulate genetically. So this advantage uh, we, we take after the, afterward. And using this preparation, the Roland uh, gear um, uh, monitored, uh, loaded uh, basic, uh, vesicular uh, fluorescent tag into the, uh, into the, into the vesicle during the endocytosis, and uh, he actually leveled abundant uh, vesicles in the nerve tongue and, and monitored the dynamics of the vesicles directly in the nerve tongue. And uh, Omachi, as a postdoc, he um, loaded instead a, a few uh, vesicles and then followed the single uh, vesicle traffic. And uh, during the high frequency stimulation, he managed to see the directional movement, start, which started after stimulation. And so these are the uh, kind of advancement. And uh, Zach Taufik, and, uh, who came from Mariama unit, and, uh, and joined us and helped us for the, uh, you know, PIP2 issues and everything. And, but now he became interested in proteomics, and he devised he elaborated very high resolution proteins by himself. And so I advised him to uh, learn the uh, synaptic vesicle uh, fraction from Reinhardt Yan in Göttingen. So he visited Reinhardt Yan in Göttingen and learned how to separate synaptic vesicle fraction from the synaptosomal fraction. And so uh, he did a, a synaptosomal and um, vesicular fraction uh, proteomics and found three times more uh, abundant uh, protein than previously reported. So it's a lot of protein hidden because of the similarity in the structure and also the abundance is low. So he has actually picked up many or almost every uh, less abundant, uh, unabundant uh, protein. And so this is a quite a nice catalog and a platform for the future study. And in fact, many of the uh, this protein, including the very uh, rare proteins, uh, as can be associated with the neuronal disease and cognitive and uh, sensory and motor and, and these are all associated like this. So this is a, a big future, future for, the, uh, for, the, uh, and for the future studies, I must say. So by, but, uh, <coughs> but we are um, still in the uh, electrophysiological side, and uh, uh, we thought it's important to characterize the synaptic dysfunction uh, in, the, in the main major <laughs> major brain disease, and which is a Parkinson disease and Alzheimer's disease, which is most abundant among people, and uh, which is very serious and very difficult to cure. And so, uh, and these two uh, diseases have a common features, and both uh, uh, you know, start uh, from the low part of the brain, like a brainstem, and go up to the higher upper brain. and. Uh, 
So the protein, both are uh, carried by the protein, and the protein, the alpha synuclein for Parkinson's disease, and tau for the Alzheimer's disease. And alpha synuclein uh, is a wild type alpha synuclein monomer. Uh, uh, is soluble um, type alpha synuclein accumulates and then polymerizes and then precipitates into the so called Levy body, LV. And then it's, you can see the, uh, the you can see by uh, by in, in, by uh, histology where it is, so that they found <coughs> that it is in the uh, basal ganglia, which is a center of the motor control. So when the alpha synuclein precipitate into the, into the basal ganglia, motor control is distorted. And this uh, propagation is like prion, and it's a neuro, interneuronal or a transsynaptic trans, uh, transfer. And uh, <clears throat> in the case of Alzheimer's disease, and uh, it is a tau protein, which is tau is usually attached to the microtubules, and in fact it is assembling multiple my, microtubules. But when it is phosphorylated, it is detached from the microtubules. And phosphorylation is made by different factors, including beta amyloid. <coughs> and the beta amyloid usually uh, increase early in the, uh, in the age, say up to 50 or 60 years old. And then when it comes to the plateau, the tau start to increase. And the tau, when, as tau increases, the cognitive problem starts. So it has a more direct correlation between tau and uh, cognitive uh, impairment. And uh, <coughs> so we thought it is important to follow up the tau as a target. So, so first, we wanted to know what happens if you inject tau or alpha synuclein into the calyx of held presynaptic tunnel. <coughs> so we did it. And then we found that it works quite strongly and it actually reduced the EPSC size to 20% uh, or less within 30 minutes in the case of tau. But when it is stimulated at one hertz, but when it's stimulated at open to one hertz, you have a very little effect. So it's a frequency dependent uh, rundown of the EPSC. And uh, similarly, <coughs> the alpha synuclein, when it is loaded, at open O3 hertz stimulation, it has no effect. But when it is stimulated at 100 hertz, the transmission from pet to postsynaptic by action potentials uh, decrease. So its a fidelity of transmission is declined with time. So, and uh, then alpha synuclein uh, actually um, impairs uh, the fidelity strongly in the presence of alpha synuclein. And so this is, so altogether, this is a sort of, you know, high pass, a low pass filter effect. So it, it just blocks a high frequency uh, transmission. The, but low frequency transmission is going through. So it's a low pass filter, so called. And this low pass filter we see also in the, in the effect of the uh, general anesthetics, isofluran, so which was found by one the postdoc. <coughs> so in the case of the isofluran uh, blocks uh, uh, synaptic transmission, and uh, but it is more strongly at higher frequency, at 200 hertz, it has a very strong effect, but open to hertz, there's no effect. So it has, it is, a, again, it is a low pass filter. So uh, the frequency of the transmission is very, very important. And uh, so low, fre low frequency uh, transmission is important for the maintain the life. And if you block it, the life is lost. But high frequency stimulation, you can, you can lose it. But you lose a high function of the brain, such as a cognition and a motor control, or the release of the important uh, molecules, like a, a monoamine transmitter, like a dopamine, serotonin, and uh, uh, noradrenaline, and also peptides, including substance B. So these ne need a high frequency stimulation to release. 
So, so the high frequency stimulation is a kind of a key point to the high functioning brain. brain. And uh, so these key functions are impaired. So it is not surprising that if, we, if the tau accumulates, uh, if, if the alpha synuclein accumulates the basal ganglia, its function is impaired. And if it, appear, if it accumulates, the tau accumulates in the hippocampus, it impairs its, its role of the cognition, the learning and the memory. <coughs> and it is not surprising also that when general anesthesia is applied, everything is attenuated everywhere. So that is our tentative conclusion. And so the next step is to, to find out the, the uh, target <coughs> of the, of the uh, peptide and the, the pathogenic protein. And so we did a capacitance measurement, and we found that it was endocytosis. It was attacked first. So the tower alpha synuclein actually impairs endocytosis first. And when endocytosis is, is compromised, then the exocytosis gradually declines. And because of the recycling, and uh, the recycling cannot catch up the vesicle uh, supply at the release sites, which is more severe when the release is at high frequency. So it explains why high frequency uh, transmission is impaired so easily. So, but anyway, the target, the main target is endocytosis. So the next question is, why is the endocytosis impaired by tower synchrony? So we have, <coughs> and the, you have to remember that the tau is a microtubus binding protein, and it actually assembles tubulin into the microtubes. And also alpha synuclein has a similar effect. So, uh, and in fact, if you inject the uh, tau into the calyx terminal in the green uh, um, uh, picture, and so you'll see the, the tau loaded in that calyx. And in this calyx, microtubules also increase in a pink uh, color. And uh, the important thing is that uh, there is one another player which is called the dynamin. And the dynamin, the GTPS, monomeric and GTPS of the 100 kilo delta, large monomeric GTP. And this is important for the endocytosis because it cut off the membrane from the plasma membrane to the vesicle. So it's the final cutting off of the membrane. And the dynamin, surprisingly, the dynamin is a microtubule spiking protein which I found in the old literature. And it was discovered as a microtubule binding protein. So I thought that it must be the dynamin which sequestered, <coughs> which is sequestered by the microtubules over assembled by tau. So that was my hypothesis, and we actually tested that. And, then I, then, and in fact, here in the in vitro experiments made by Takei in Nakayama, and uh, so dynamic uh, by itself is soluble most of the time, but if you put the microtubes, most of them are, are kind of insoluble, so it's a PPT increase. Likewise, <coughs> in the slice uh, loaded with the calyx, uh, with, uh, um, with the tau, the, the insoluble, immobile uh, dynamic increases. So it, it means that the free uh, soluble dynamic decreases. So this is consistent. So, so it's a time to rescue the disease. And so, so we, we actually, um, the simplest way to <coughs> rescue that, uh, the synaptic dysfunction is to depolymerize the microtubules. So we have used that. Uh, nocodazole, which is known to be a depolymerizer, and it nicely or perfectly this recovers the endocytic uh, impairment in both our and and tau and, uh, and EPSC rundown and fidelity rundown. So all were actually solved by uh, breaking out the microtubes 
but we need more specific <laughs> weight rescue because nocotazole is not a, is not going to be a good drug. <laughs> so we actually <coughs> try to find out the uh, interaction side between microtubes and dynamo, and which is not known. So we had to need a screening assay, and uh, we, we made, randomly made uh, 20 <laughs> peptides at the at the pH domain, which is which is thought to be a pH domain, which is interesting. So, and we found that uh, the number five uh, peptide, which is pH DP five, we we call has a has a risking effect. So it rescues the in vitro um, binding and rescue <coughs> the endocytosis in the blue, and then rescue the the synaptic random. So, so this uh, peptide PHDP5 is quite good in this case. So, okay, we have a very small uh, time left, but the, the left, uh, we have another two slides to go. So, <coughs> so uh, then we wanted to 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 load it to the real animal <laughs> in vivo. And so we um, decided to uh, infuse it into the Alzheimer's disease model mass. And so uh, to before that, we have to be sure that it goes into the brain. So we put the added CP cell permeable peptide sequence at the C C terminal and uh, mon to monitor we have the FITC uh, in the end terminal. And also we made a scramble control. And then <coughs> we infused the mice uh, through the nose, so nasal infusion. So five times, uh, uh, no, no, four, uh, five days, once, one, one, one time in one day, and five days a week, except for Saturday and Sunday, <laughs> and uh, for, for four weeks. And then, uh, when we see, uh, had a, a cut in the tissue section, we found that fortunately <laughs> this peptide was found in the hippocampus. So this is because probably the nose is, nasal membrane is very close to the hippocampus. That is one advantage. Another advantage is that uh, that part is not very much uh, <laughs> protected by the blood blood barrier. So these two, uh, we, uh, we have got that uh, drug into the brain, so these are for campus regions, and these white spots on the right hand side is the other FITC of the PhDP5. And then we, we did a, a behavior task, and so this is a Morris water maze, so called the famous and standard method for the learning and memory test. And uh, so when the mice is put into the water bus, which is a turbid uh, solution, and if, although there is a platform, mice don't, don't know whether there is. And the mice learn how to get it <coughs> with time, and, uh, in the, and it becomes faster and faster in normal cases. But in this AD uh, Alzheimer's disease model mouse, it never learns, and so, and so it is nearly flat, even after four days trial. And uh, it's the same for the scramble infused mice. But if you infuse PHDP5, then it runs like a wild type. So it actually acquires a memory uh, learning ability during the, by the infusion. On the right hand side is a memory task. It's, it's a testing the memory retention. So in the fifth day, you remove the platform and uh, let the mice or, um, swim in the in the bus, and then, then you follow the trajectory. And uh, the original the uh, the original place of the of the uh, platform is one quadrant. And uh, so, how many times in the mice uh, visit that quadrant is evaluated. And in the case of the AD mouse, it never visits there, uh, so preferentially. So it's less than 20%, 5%. But in the case of PHDP5 applied uh, mice, <coughs> it is improved 
and the more than uh, nearly 40% of the time, they are staying in that preference. So they are remembering whether uh, that there is a platform in that code. So it, it actually recovers the memory. So learning and memory is recovered. So it is our interpreters. So just to, <coughs> to follow my trajectory, I started uh, to uh, find out the sense of transmitter, and then made a synthesized preparation uh, to test, uh, test the excited, the excitation. And then uh, after some training in the UCL and also in collaboration with molecular biologists, I, uh, <coughs> I uh, developed a particular method in synthesis. And uh, I actually <coughs> uh, put it to the presynaptic camera preparation calyx help, and where we introduce uh, capacitance measurement and make a basic X and cytosis. And also the presynaptic imaging and synaptic proteomics, but uh, then we test the synaptic dysfunction mechanism in Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. And we were able to rescue synaptic dysfunction at least in the AD mass model. So the, the final end <coughs> should be to rescue the patient. But, uh, but uh, the time is over. <laughs> so that is. <laughs> And so, but it's okay, it's not my job to do that. So it's a job of the pharmaceutical company or the clinician. So I'm happy to open <coughs> the possibly open these results to the, to the world and to some good laboratory to advance that. So these are our members, staffs. And uh, uh, so thank you very much for your listening. Thank you okay. very much, Tomoki, for you. your long time uh, uh, contribution to OIST and then the uh, high level of research. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and then uh, there's a, a, a reward for this uh, uh, sem seminar. So uh, the provost office uh, prepared uh, this uh, uh, plaque. Uh, So uh, the, uh, that sentence is, Dear Tomuki, uh, in admiration of your pioneering investigation into what really happens in the synapses in our brain. So enjoy more time to play tennis in Kyoto. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much.